Okay, so I guess I need to tell you about my background. The first computer I worked on was a VIC-20 that my older brother bought. And then eventually I upgraded to a Commodore 64. And I got, I got my first Raspberry Pis. We got a couple of them a few weeks ago. And plugging it into the TV really brought back memories. Um, I started using Linux in 94. I installed Linux from a stack of of uh, floppy disks. So, anyway, but I don't work in computers. I just like to do this stuff for fun, and it, uh, I find it works better than the stuff that my colleagues use. So, um, I'm actually a physicist at BYU. I do atomic physics and teach physics. And uh, I'm going to be talking to you about electronics. This was, uh, I was asked to come and give the talk that I gave at Open West a few months ago. And kind of the, the idea behind this talk is, it sounds like some of you have done some electronics, maybe a lot of you, but there's probably a lot of people here who really know technology, you know code, but you haven't done hardware before, and now uh, you've got Arduinos and Raspberry Pis coming out, and you're seeing all these cool projects people do with them, and you're thinking, gee, I know how to do fancy coding. I need to learn some electronics so I can start soldering some stuff onto this. And incidentally, that red box right there inside that is a Raspberry Pi. I decided to do my presentation on a Raspberry Pi tonight just to show off how cool these things are. For 25 bucks, you can get a computer on a board that you can browse the web and do JavaScript uh, presentations on. So this is all brought to you by a Raspberry Pi. Okay, so. Um, my goals, so I'm not going to go in depth into electronics. If you've done some electronics before, you're not going to learn anything today because I'm going to start with the very basic stuff so that you can, you know, basically, those of you who haven't done electronics before, you'll get just enough of the lingo and the terminology and how to think about it that uh, you won't be intimidated going on and finding things out on your own. You guys are computer people. You know what's out there on the web, right? You don't, you don't go to Amazon and order a book. You, it's the information's there at your fingertips. When I learned electronics, I used a book called The Art of Electronics, which is kind of the Bible of hobbyist electronics. Um, uh, but nowadays, you can find everything online, so you probably don't even need to buy it, although it is a really good book. Um, I learned electronics. I do uh, some electronics at home as a hobbyist. Um, my, I'm doing my first Raspberry Pi project. It's going to be my wife's birthday present. Don't tell her. She's been wondering what my daughter, why my daughter and I have been spending so much time with the Raspberry Pi. Um, but most of my electronics that I've done as part of my work, I'm an experimentalist, and we've had to build a lot of electronics. And I'm not an electrical engineer. This, I've had to kind of learn this on my own. I needed to find something out, so I found it out. And in the process, we've built some pretty cool stuff. We have, uh, at one point, we built one of the most stable Labor, lasers in the nation, and we built our own current supply for it, which is, as far as I know, the most stable, quiet laser current driver ever made. So you can get schematics for that and build your own if you want off my web page. But um, I'm going to start off telling you some of the essential things you need to own and know how to use just to get started with electronics. And the first thing is what's called a solderless breadboard. And I have a box back there with a bunch of this stuff in here, so if afterwards you want to see what this stuff really you know, feels like, uh, you can come and take a look at it. But a solderless breadboard is a way to prototype electronics quickly. It's just a little board like this, and it's got a bunch of holes in it that you can stick wires and chips and you know, capacitor leads, resistor leads into. The cool thing is, each of these columns is connected together. So when I stick that chip in here, if I plug a wire in here, that wire is connected to that pin of that chip. So it gives you a way to quickly hook things up. These rows down here along the bottom, they're all connected this way so that you can you know, plug your power supply in here. You, know, you can put like plus 15 volts ground, minus 15 volts, whatever. And then you have that power all along there. On some boards, these power buses are not connected across the middle, so you have a separate bus here and a separate bus here. If you don't like that, just jumper it with a wire, right? But that's a good way to start putting electronics together quickly because you don't have to solder. If something doesn't work, you just pull it out. If you want to change something, it's really quick. And I know I have some colleagues that, you know, they build these physics experiments, they need some circuit, so they'll build it on one of these solderless breadboards, and then they'll glue the solderless breadboard inside of an aluminum box, put some connectors on it, and they're done. <laughs> I don't recommend that because these things can be flaky sometimes, and if a wire moves the wrong way, the connection might be broken. So when I 
when I build electronics, I'll, uh, if, it's, if it's a circuit that I've done before and I know it's going to work, I'll just solder it right together. And if there's a problem, I'll unsolder and fix it. Otherwise, I'll build little pieces of the circuit, make sure that piece works, then transfer it over to a printed circuit board, and then you know, debug the next piece on um, my bread, solderless breadboard. Okay, so printed circuit boards, right? There's that piece of plastic that's inside every computer, every piece of electronics. And you know, you buy a piece of electronics and this, this circuit board has wire traces that connect everything together. But you can also get generic prototyping boards that are kind of laid out like the solderless breadboard where you have a bunch of things connected together. You can stick a chip on there and connect wires to it and so forth. This is one that I... Uh, actually designed for my lab. We do a lot of electronics and so we have this generic prototyping board with BNC connectors and things that fit right into a box and it's got our standard lab power input. But you can also buy generic ones. Uh, this is one made by Vector Board. And you can see you've got these holes and it's got uh, things, the, the, the conductors connect the holes together. So I can plug a chip into here and then plug a wire into there and it'll be connected to the chip. Now when you go to buy uh, perf board or perforated circuit board, make sure that it is the kind that has the holes connected together. Some of them have individual holes and you stick something in there and then somehow you've got to get a wire to connect to that and it's a pain. Some of them don't even have any copper on them at all, no metal at all, and those are even worse. So make sure you get the kind with the wire buses, with the holes connected together. All right. Um, Next thing you're going to need to start building stuff is wire to connect everything together. So when you go to buy wire, you find there's all kinds of wire. The two main things you want to know about now is that wire comes in different diameters. That's the first one. Um, usually the diameter is described by, rather than giving you like this, so many millimeters, they'll tell you it's some like 22 AWG, American Wire Gauge. So 22 gauge, that tells you the diameter of the wire. Gauge is kind of weird. It's one of these scales where bigger gauge means smaller wire. 22 gauge is a good size to get for hobbyist projects because they fit into the holes of your solderless breadboard. They're reasonably hefty. They can carry some current. If you have a high current application, you know, then you're going to maybe want thicker wire. The other thing you should know about wire is they come in solid or stranded varieties. So if I get 22 gauge wire, if I get solid 22 gauge wire, it'll be a solid piece of copper with some plastic around it, some insulator around it. If I get stranded, it'll be, the total diameter of the wire will be 22 gauge, but it'll be made up of a bunch of much smaller wires. That makes it more flexible, which is nice, but uh, those small wires, they're easy to break off. Sometimes they, they tend to break. Um, also, they don't stick into the solderless breadboard very well. So I would start off with solid 22 gauge wire. and use that until you see some reason not to. Um, the next thing you need in order to deal with your wire, how many people have done electronics before? Okay, so there's like three people who are getting anything out of this. Feel free to correct me <laughs> if I say anything wrong. But um, in order to work with your wire, you're going to need wire cutters and wire strippers. So wire strippers, they look kind of like pliers. They have a bunch of holes. And each hole is labeled with a wire gauge. You choose the right one for your wire. You clamp onto it and you pull. And the insulation comes off so that you can stick your wire into your circuit board or whatever and solder to it. Make sure you use the right gauge. If you put it into a hole with a larger gauge, it may not do anything. It may catch on the insulation and stretch it, but not really cut it. Um, if you use too small of a gauge, when you clamp down, it'll put a nick on the wire and eventually that nick will break and your wire will pop off and that's no good. All right, and then this is a, these are called side cutters. They're good for cutting wire, trimming off leads that are, you know, after you solder, you can trim the excess lead off and so forth. Um, Another thing you should have if you're going to do electronics is have an assortment of resistors. When you go to buy the components for this project you want to do, don't just buy the resistors you're going to need. Buy a whole kit. Make sure you've got a kit of them. They're really cheap, like penny a resistor kind of prices. They're really cheap. Have a whole bunch of them because when you tweak things, usually what you're tweaking is you're changing resistor values. So you want to have a bunch to choose from. Um, yes? I say regarding kits like that, um, eBay's been really good for me. Yeah? And there's a website called FutureLEC, F-U-T-U-R-E-L-E-C. I'm not familiar com. with that one. It's some 
it's a Chinese company that distributes towards sort of like the amateur hobbyist. Uh -huh. They have lots of like resistor kits and capacitor kits and transistor kits and things like that that are priced cool. like a few bucks a piece. Um, but don't expect them anytime soon. Their shipping is like slow boat. Yeah. yeah. Because it is coming across from China. I once ordered something for the lab I needed like next day from a company in China. And this, I called their American representative. They said, yeah, we got them in stock. We'll ship them next day. A week later, they weren't there. And they said, yeah, they were in stock in China. When the boat pulls in, we're going to send them next day. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, so, yeah, resistor kits. Um, future lek that's what I need to look into. Um, a multimeter is a really handy thing to have. A multimeter is something that can measure, a typical multimeter can measure volts, can voltage, can measure current, can measure resistance, and usually they'll have a continuity checker which will you know, tell you if you put a lead here and a lead here, it tells you whether there's an electrical pathway between the two. Um, if you want to know the resistance of something, measure the resistor out of the circuit. I always have students who are like, Dr. Durfee, this resistance seems too low. And yeah, it's because the current from the multimeter is going through the resistor, but it's also going through the rest of the circuit, and so it's not reading just the resistance of the resistor. Um, if you get a nicer one, they'll measure capacitance and things. This one will measure capacitance uh, as well, which is kind of nice. Um, another tool, uh, oh yeah, how to use a multimeter. So when you're measuring volts, multimeters, they're designed so that when you measure volts, not much current flows through the multimeter. So what you can do, if I want to know, this is, a, this is a schematic, we write schematics to, you know, this is like the blueprint for our electronics. This is a schematic symbol for a battery. This is the schematic symbol for a resistor. So this is just a circuit where a battery pushes current through a resistor. If I want to know the voltage across that resistor, I just take the two leads of my multimeter and I touch it to either side and it tells me what the voltage is across there. Incidentally, a multimeter never tells you absolute voltage. It only tells you how much higher is this voltage than that voltage. And it turns out when you study physics, the laws of physics as we understand them now tell us that absolute voltage has no meaning. Although I'm working on an experiment that maybe proved that wrong. <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. But uh, if, it's, if it's not true, we have a way to look at it. All right. Now, if I wanted to measure the voltage across the battery, right? I just put the meter across there. Now, if I have two meters measuring this, they probably should measure the same thing, right? Because these lines here, those represent wires and wires are conductors and the voltage on a conductor is nominally the same everywhere, right? So if this is zero volts, that ought to be zero volts. And if this is nine volts, that ought to be nine volts. All right? Okay, so there's resistors. Oh, okay. Now, what if you want to measure current? To measure current, you actually have to break your circuit and send the current through your meter where it would have gone through a wire. Now, multimeters, typically, when you measure voltage, not much current goes through them. So you have to be careful if you have really big resistors in your circuit, but usually a voltmeter, you just touch it, you measure it, and everything's fine. To measure current, you actually have to interrupt the flow, send it through your meter, and your meter tends to have a little bit of resistance in there, so it, more often than measuring voltage, it's likely to affect your circuit. So because it's harder to measure, and it's more likely to affect your circuit while you're making the measurement, when we debug circuits, we like to measure volts as much as we can and avoid me measuring amps unless we have to. All right. Um, you may be tempted to buy one of these. You really don't need this for most electronic <laughs> projects. But you will eventually need a soldering iron. <clears throat> now, you can get a soldering iron for like 15 bucks, or you can spend thousands of dollars on them. I have one in my lab that I think we paid $500 for. There's really, for hobbyist electronics, you really don't need anything fancy. But if you do it a lot, you can spend as much money as you want. The idea of a soldering iron, if we have time, we probably won't. But if we have time, I'll tell you more about soldering. But the end of it gets really hot. Don't touch it. <laughs> you hold that onto your electronic component that you want to solder. You take the solder, you put it on there. The solder melts and holds everything together. Um, if we have time, I'll tell you a little bit about soldering. In any case, before you solder, read how to do it because bad solder joints really are frustrating. Has anyone like bought a commercial product with bad solder joints? And it's like, why does it, it works, it doesn't work. It works. It works for an hour, then it stops working. It's really frustrating debugging uh, bad solder joints. Now, inevitably, you're going to make a mistake or some component's going to die and you're going to need to take something off of your circuit board. And this is a handy tool for doing that. Uh, does anyone use solder braid? Desoldering braid, you like it? 
I can't, I've never been able to, I don't know, I've never been able to use it. It's never worked for me. I love these desoldering tools. Yeah, maybe. But uh, I love the desoldering tools. The idea with the desoldering tool, it's a little spring-loaded thing. You push this thing down with your thumb and it pushes a little uh, rod down into this plastic tip. The plastic tip is made of thermal plastic. You can put it right up to your soldering iron tip. You get the soldering iron tip on your joint that you're trying to desolder. You get the solder to melt. You stuff this thing right into it. You push the button. The rod shoots back and it sucks the solder up with it. So. Uh, you look for them online, they're called desoldering tools. If you, you go into my lab and you want to find one, ask for a solder sucker or else my students won't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, um, as you get going, you need more f fancy stuff. Probably the next things you'd get would be an oscilloscope and a function generator. They're a little bit pricier. Um, there's some cheaper f ways to, to get them now, um, now that people are doing more hobbyist embedded systems. Uh, so, you know, maybe your first project with your Raspberry Pi is to turn it into a function generator and an oscilloscope. Then you don't have to buy one. All right. Um, where to get things? Fut future Electronics is the place I'm going to go check out. Future, future Lec. Okay. The place I usually buy things from are DigiKey and Mauser. Um, they have all kinds of stuff. They're really geared for big companies buying lots of stuff, but they'll sell to you and me too. And they have all kinds of stuff. And you'll be amazed. When you go and look at electronic components, you'll be amazed how cheap it is. When you buy a computer, you're not paying for the chips, except for the CPU. Most of the stuff on there, it's like the chips are free, but you had to pay someone to put it uh, in a piece of plastic to make that piece of plastic they put them on. That costs money. When I build electronics in the lab, we build the world's most sensitive, you know, most stable laser current driver, the box was more expensive than the circuit board, which is more expensive than everything we put on it. Well, if you take two kind of special components off anyway. Um, Allied Electronics has a lot of stuff, but their search engine is really horrible, so I only use them if I can't find something somewhere else and I know exactly what partner I'm look part number I'm looking for. And eBay, of course, is great for finding. There's new stuff on eBay. If you're gonna buy an oscilloscope, the oscilloscopes can be pretty expensive. You can find them used for a fraction of the price, and they're still pretty decent. Yeah. I was going to add a couple more too. There's um, SparkFun. Like SparkFun. Sells lots of kits. SparkFun has lots of like Arduino stuff and variants on the Arduino. They're a cool Arduino place. Arduino equipment. They also have uh -huh. a bunch of Pi stuff, but they also have uh -huh. great video tutorials. So a mm -hmm. lot of some of the stuff that we're talking about here, you may be able to do more in depth. And, uh huh. Um, Adafruit. Uh, uh huh. Also been there. Lots of tutorials and forums and stuff like that. You can spell that. Um, A D A F R U I T. It's um, it's run by a woman. I can't remember her real name. She goes by Lady Ada. She's a former MIT student. Cool. If you need to buy something quickly, if you if you just want like four resistors and you don't want to have to send away in the mail form, Radio Shack still sells some components. They used, I mean, when I was a kid, Radio Shack was this hobbyist place, and now they mostly want to sell badly functioning cell phones and things. But they still have some components. If you go there, take a friend, because there's going to be someone there who doesn't know what they're talking about, who is going to insist on answering all your questions, and who will follow you around. So you need someone to distract them while you go back and find what you're looking for. <laughs> a better place, though, is Central Utah Electronics. It's just right across the street from the Provo Cemetery. That's a, they've got all kinds of stuff there. Um, that's a cool place to go look for electronics. Okay, um, this doesn't display as well on my Arduino browser, but uh, you don't have to write all this stuff down, by the way. If you go to this link here, there's a QR code. You get that and your, uh, the whole, all the slides are online. But what I did is I figured, okay, if you're just starting out in electronics, what do you need to get? So what I did is I went to these sites and I kind of looked and said, if I were starting all over again, you know, getting, looking for stuff that's not too expensive I can buy for home, this is what I'd buy. So I haven't necessarily used any of these parts. I just looked at their specs, but this is what I, I would get if I were going to do it again. I don't use this stuff because I have like a real electronics budget in my lab to buy really nice stuff. And, <laughs> and so if I need something, I have a cheap soldering iron at home, but if I really need to do some work, I'll take it up to my lab where I have everything. Um, but anyway, you can go and look at that, at that list here. Yeah, so DigiKey, 360 carbon film resistors for 15 bucks. So for 15 bucks, you can, you know, have a supply to play around with.
I don't I definitely don't use those ones in my lab because I don't allow carbon film resistors in my lab. But that's because we do precision work. Um, you 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 won't care. You won't know the difference unless, yeah. Okay. Okay, so now, how does electronics work? Electronics works because little charged particles move around. And there's the three first things usually you learn about how these particles move, move around are, is something called voltage or potential measured in volts. And that's the force, that, that's, that's what causes the particles to move around. If, if I have a voltage difference, charge wants to move from high voltage, positive charge wants to move from high voltage to low voltage. Current measured in amps, we usually uh, write that as an I. Uh, that's how many charges, units of charge per second are traveling through a wire or a component. And then resistance tells us how a component resists the flow of charge through it. To make an analogy with water flow, uh, potential or voltage is like pressure. Current is flow rate, you know, gallons per minute, coulombs per second. And resistance is the constriction that prevents the flow. When I first started learning about electronics, I thought resistors were the stupidest thing ever. I mean, if I were doing plumbing, would I intentionally go and put a little narrow segment of pipe to resist the flow? I mean, I made this pressure to make water flow. Why am I stopping it from flowing? But it turns out resistors are actually awesome. Okay. Uh, this, let me interrupt. This is all DC, right? Uh, so I'm just going to talk about DC today. So AC analysis. Uh-huh. 99% of all electronic devices are entirely DC. Yes, and by entirely you mean they, they things have, change, but they change slowly enough that you don't think about it. Well, they have to have a power supply to convert the AC to DC. And then right. Through your mm -hmm. your yeah. Okay. So like, say you had a microphone and you wanted to amplify it. That's an oscillating signal, right? But it oscillates so slowly compared to how fast things change in your electronics. You can pretend like in any given moment, the voltages everywhere are exactly what they've been forever, right? You can instantaneously pretend like nothing's changing. But when you get to higher frequencies, you know, megahertz, gigahertz, then you have to worry about things behaving oddly, differently than they did at lower frequencies. So what I'm going to tell you about, if you're doing a circuit where everything is like below a kilohertz or so, you know, 20 kilohertz is what you can hear with sound. So probably sound, you're probably OK for the most part, ignoring the fact that your signal is actually oscillating. If you get the higher frequency stuff, if you're going to build your own you know, network receiver or something, giga, gigabit per second network receiver, then you need to know more than the kind of things we're talking about here. Oh, whoops, I didn't talk about resistors. I need to go back. Isn't this Raspberry Pi awesome? 25 bucks, you can do this. Um, so a resistor is basically something that resists the flow of electrical flow. So these are some leaded resistors right here. This is the kind of things you'd put in your project. Um, to describe what a resistor does, I've got a little plot here I drew. As you increase the voltage across the resistor, the current going through it increases. That makes sense. If I have a water pipe, put more pressure, I'm going to get more flow. A resistor is special because the current increases proportional to the voltage. You see, that's a straight line. And they work backwards, too. If I, if I put a negative voltage across it, right, meaning a voltage that increases in the opposite direction, current, I get negative current. I get current flowing in the opposite direction. That's what a resistor is. Uh, bigger resistance means shallower slope, right? The current doesn't increase as quickly with voltage. Uh, resistors follow something called Ohm's law. All right, is there a question back there? No, okay. Ask questions whenever you want. It's awesome you have your kids here. The sooner they get exposed to this, the less barriers they build up. So that's awesome. Um, okay, so here I've got my little circuit diagram, right? I've got a battery and a resistor. If I know the voltage that this battery is producing, let's say it's epsilon, all right? That's the same voltage that's going to be across my resistor, right? If this is 0 volts, that's 0 volts. If this is 9 volts, that's 9 volts. So if I have this voltage I've put across my resistor, how much current flows through it? Well, I just take Ohm's law and I solve it for current, right? Divide both sides by R and plug in the voltage of my battery for the voltage, and I say, oh, that's how much current flows through my resistor. So Ohm's law is just that easy, just simple algebra. All right, now. Uh, if I have multiple resistors hooked together, a lot of times you can just treat that as one resistor when you go to analyze things. All right? If I have two resistors connected together in series, in series means the current flows through one, then it flows through the other. You can think about this. What if I had two identical resistors? Let's say I put 10 volts across one resistor and I get some current. If I take two resistors and put the same 10 volts across it, 
Well, they're identical resistors with the same current flowing through them, right? So Ohm's law says the voltage drop across that one must be the same as the voltage drop across that one. That means half of my 10 volts is across here and half of it's across there. I'm going to get half the current flowing through those resistors. So if I put two resistors in series, two identical resistors, they act like one resistor with twice the resistance. In general, if I put a bunch of resistors in series, I can just add the resistances together to get the effective resistance. If my resistors are in parallel, however, imagine I have two identical resistors. I put 10 volts across them. I'm going to get current flowing through here, and I'm going to get current flowing through there. So now I'm going to get twice as much current flowing through them. So two identical resistors where the current flows in parallel through them is going to have an effective resistance of half of what one resistor is, because I get twice as much current. In general, if I have a whole bunch of resistors in parallel, I take each of the resistors, take one over their resistance, add them all together, take one over that, and that's my effective resistance. All right, so that's what we do when we add resistors in parallel. Okay, so now we're ready for our first actual circuit that does something useful. It's called a voltage divider. So imagine you've got your Raspberry Pi, right? Now imagine you have some like device that's maybe measuring when the lights get turned on. You've got a photodiode, it goes to some analog to digital converter, and it's going to put out some digital signal. Now in electronics, we represent ones and zeros with different voltages. So imagine your analog to digital converter is putting out a signal of ones and zeros and it's using 5 volts and 0 volts to represent 1 and 0. Unfortunately, the Raspberry Pi runs at 3.3 volts, and if you put 5 volts on the input, it will die. So how can I divide my 5 volts down to 3.3 volts? Well, here's a circuit that will do it. I put my 5 volts in here, and I get my 3.3 volts out here if I choose my resistors right. How do I choose my resistors? How do I figure out what's going on here? I'm going to use Ohm's Law. The first thing I'm going to do Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that no current is flowing out this direction. All right? That may be a pretty bad assumption, but I'm going to assume it's true. If it's not true, I'm going to show you a way to fix it so it will be true. But it's a lot easier to analyze circuits if you assume nothing flows out the output, because then I can just think about this. I don't have to think about what comes next. All right? So I'm going to assume no current flows out here. That means all the current flows here. What does this little symbol here represent? That's ground. That's zero volts usually. All right. So I have some voltage here. I have zero volts here. I have two resistors in series. That's just an effective resistance with a voltage across it, a Vn, right? So the voltage across here is Vn, and the current flowing through here is just that effective volt, or that voltage divided by the effective resistance. And what's the effective resistance? Yeah, those two resistors are just in series, so the current flowing down there is just V in over R1 plus R2. So now I know the current, how do I find V out? Well, if I apply Ohm's law just to this resistor, it tells me that this voltage minus this voltage is that current times that resistance, right? V, is e v equals IR. So the V in Ohm's law is the difference in voltage on the two sides of the resistor. So I'll apply that. So V out minus zero is equal to I times the current going through that resistor. But what is the current going through that resistor? It's what we just found earlier, right? So you plug it in and you find and solve for V out and you get that V out is just V in times this. All right, so you can choose your resistors now to say, well, if this is 5 volts, and let's say I arbitrarily choose to let R2 be 10K, I can solve for this and find what R1 needs to be to give me 3.3 volts instead. So that's a voltage divider. Okay, now, what if current actually flows out here? I'm going to connect this up to something. I'm going to connect this up to my Raspberry Pi, and some current's going to flow into it. That's going to mess up my circuit, right? Well, as long as not very much current flows, I'm okay. All right, so when we do electronics, we like to talk about input impedance and output impedance. All right, so I can treat my Raspberry Pi input as if it were just a resistor to ground. Then I can look up on the spec sheet and it will tell me the input impedance of this pin is, you know, 10 mega ohms or something, you know, whatever it is. And so that tells me I can kind of pretend like what's coming next is just a resistor to ground. And if that resistance is really big compared to this resistor, most of the current will go this way instead of that way. All right? So the idea is you want what comes next to have a big input impedance so that not much current flows through there. All right? Okay. Now, the next thing 
We already talked a little bit about DC versus AC. Once you start to get really fast changing signals in your circuit, you have to worry about lots of other stuff. And if you haven't done this before, if you remember back in high school math when we did complex numbers and you said, why in the world would I ever want to use complex numbers? When you start doing AC circuits, you'll find out why. But we're not going to talk about that today. All right? Um, okay. Passive circuits. They're a passive electrical element is one that doesn't do any weird nonlinear stuff and doesn't take power to do it. All right? And the three basic passive components are resistors, capacitors, that's a symbol for a capacitor, here's some capacitors, that's a capacitor, that's a capacitor, they come in all different shapes and sizes, and inductors, that's a symbol for the inductor and that's an inductor right there. All right? Um, a very hand wavy bad description, capacitors tend to smooth out wiggles in voltage and inductors tend to smooth out wiggles in current. All right? And inductors and capacitors are mostly used when you worry about things changing in time. So um, anyway, I said I wasn't going to talk about that. You will worry about like when you start to do audio circuits, if you want to make like a low pass filter or something so that some frequencies do something different than others, you'll end up using capacitors and inductors. The one thing I will tell you though is that <coughs> whenever you have a chip that you wire up that takes power, you're going to want to put some capacitors to ground on the power lines as close as you can to the chip. Because what will happen is the power lines that power up your chip, they'll have some inductance. And if the chip tries to do something suddenly and suddenly it needs a lot of current, it won't be able to get it and the voltage at the power will drop. So you put these capacitors here, they act like kind of little batteries that can supply the current while it's waiting for the current to come from the power supply. So uh, you look at data sheets for your stuff and find out what uh, blocking resistor, what blocking capacitors they uh, suggest. If it doesn't tell you any, if you're just in a hurry, usually 0.1 microfarads is a good value for that. Okay. Um, okay, now we're going to talk about diodes. And probably if you get an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi and you solder something to it, probably the very first thing you're going to want to do is like hook up an LED and make it flash on and off, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about diodes. A diode, <coughs> kind of the most easy description of a diode is it's something that lets current go one way and not the other way. All right? It's like a wire that only works one way. But it's not really. To give a more complete picture, I drew this little plot here, right? So for resistors, I increase the voltage, the current increases linearly. With a diode, if I increase the voltage, the current starts to go up, but it doesn't go up linearly. If I make the voltage go the other way, current really doesn't flow until I reach some threshold where it breaks down. Now, diodes can break down in various ways. Some diodes will die and smoke and stink when you put too much reverse voltage on them. Other diodes are actually designed to be run out here where they break down. They actually are designed to start let current flow, to let current flow at a very particular voltage, and they use them in power supplies as a voltage reference. So they do different things. <coughs> in a real diode, when you go the other direction, it doesn't immediately turn on. It takes a little bit of voltage to get your diode going. Not much current flows until you hit some threshold, and then the current grows exponentially. For a standard silicon diode that you might use in a circuit, the threshold voltage is about 0.6 volts. So it takes about 0.6 volts before current starts to flow through it. LEDs have higher threshold voltages, and it turns out the threshold voltage is when you study solid state physics, you find out that that threshold voltage is actually tied directly to the wavelength of the light that the diode puts out. So red, all red LEDs have thresholds about 2 volts and blue ones have thresholds that are about 3 volts. All right. Now, so you're going to go and you're going to make your diode circuit. You're going right, to take your diode, you're going to solder it to that output port, right? And then solder the other end to ground and then you're going to turn it on and it will fry. And why does it fry? because you gave it too much voltage. Well, let's, uh, let's get a power supply, let's adjust the voltage just right. Turns out that's really hard to do, because remember, the current changes exponentially with voltage in a diode. So if your voltage is off a little bit, you can get a lot more current than you really wanted and still kill the thing. So instead of hooking it straight up, well, you, don't, you don't really want a constant voltage supply. What you want is a constant current supply, because diodes want a very specific current. Um, Current supplies are hard to make, so this is the poor man's version. What you do is you just throw a resistor in to limit the current. So this is a symbol for a diode, right? And it tells us current can flow that way, not that way. And this little squiggly arrow there tells us this is not any diode, this is a light emitting diode, that when I put current through it, it'll emit light. All right, so what this resistor does is it makes sure that too much current doesn't flow through the diode. So how do I choose the resistor that I want to put on there? 
what you do is you look at the data sheet for the diode and it will tell you when the diode is running where it's supposed to, the voltage drop across it will be about this big and this will be the current going through it. So it tells you what current you want to put through it and what voltage it takes to do that. And then what you do is you come along and you say, look, I've got my 5 volts coming out of my Raspberry Pi, so from here to here is 5 volts. I want this much of it to be eaten up by the diode, I want the rest of it to be eaten up by the resistor. So the voltage drop across the resistor, I want to be the total voltage across the whole thing minus how much is eaten up by the diode. But that voltage is equal to the current times the resistance of my, of my resistor. I, I know what voltage I want across my diode and I know what current I want my diode to have going through it. So the only thing I don't know here, if I take this equation right here, is the resistance. So I can solve and find what the resistance is. All right, and then you find out what the resistance is, and then maybe just to be careful, you get one that's just a little bit bigger and try it out, and if it's bright enough, you're happy. If it's not, maybe you try a smaller resistor, and if it burns out, then you got one that was too small, and you get a new one and try again. All right, but now, what happens if the voltage fluctuates here a little bit? Remember, a small voltage fluctuation here changes the current exponentially. But if the voltage jumps up here and the current starts to go up, what happens with my resistor? More current means more voltage drop across my resistor. So it will tend to help linearize the current response of your circuit. So that's a good way to make diodes light up. If you're going to do like diode illumination, like you let's say you have a 24 volt power supply, you have a 12 volt diode that's going to illuminate your house, you're burning off half of your voltage in a resistor. That's not a good way to do it, right? So for high power applications, it's not a good way to do it. But for indicator LEDs, that's great. Now, if you're looking at a schematic and you see something with a circle around it, chances are it's probably a transistor. There's lots of various versions of them. Almost everything interesting that happens with electronics is because the transistor is doing something. Unfortunately, they're a little harder to uh, describe. So instead, I'm going to tell you about something that I use a lot. We use transistors in my work in my lab a lot, but more often we use something called an op amp. And an op amp, it's this little chip here this guy right here, and it's got a bunch of transistors inside of it, and electrical engineers have already figured out all the difficult things about the transistors and worked that all out to give you some nice black box where things work nice and simple and you don't have to worry about a lot of the details. Here's the symbol for an op amp. An op amp has an inverting input and a non-inverting input and an output. Okay, so the way to think about an op amp is uh, there's a little guy inside the op amp, all right? And he's going to look at these two inputs. No current flows into these inputs. All right? Well, a little bit does, but in our model we're going to say no current flows in. All right? When I say a little bit flows in, if you look, at the, if you look up the input impedances for typical op amps, they're like tens of giga ohms typically. So very little current flows in. And this guy looks in here and he says, if this voltage is bigger than that voltage, I'm going to raise the voltage of my output. If this is lower than that one, I'm going to lower the output voltage. And I'm going to keep doing that until those two are the same. So if I just put two voltages in here, it's going to keep raising or lowering it until it can't do it anymore. It's going to go all the way to the power supply or close to it. And then it'll be stuck. It can't do any more. But in most circuits, we have some sort of feedback. So as this changes, it changes one of the voltages. And it'll keep doing that until those two are the same. Now the cool thing about an op amp is hardly any current comes in here. If I'm trying to you know, establish some voltage here, and I've got some load over here that's drawing some current. Where do I get that current from to establish the voltage? It comes from a power supply, not from your inputs. All right? Now, <coughs> there's not really a little man inside op amps. I just want to be clear. I don't want anyone to go home with the wrong impression. <laughs> so, how do op amps really work? It's magic. And as we all know, Magic is just a bunch of smoke and mirrors. So that brings us to a very important topic. You should not let the smoke out of your chips. Once the magic smoke is gone, they don't work anymore. <laughs> the easiest way to get smoke out is to hook up the power backwards. Always check that you have your chip in the right way before you power it on. If you're designing something, make all your chips go the same way. Don't have one chip with the printing like this and one chip with the printing like that, or you're, somebody's going to plug one in wrong and then all the smoke will come out. <laughs> I understand they can't put it back in either. You have to get a new one. Um, Okay, so here's our simple op amp circuit. All right, this is a follower. Remember, we had this issue that if I have, let's say I make a voltage divider over here. And then it's going to go into my Raspberry Pi, but what if my Raspberry Pi sucks current? 
it's going to affect how my voltage divider works and I don't know what's going to happen. Well, what I can do is instead of going straight into my Raspberry Pi, I can go into the non-inverting input of an op amp. And almost no current flows into there, right? So I'm happy. I can understand what my voltage divider does. But now let's say the <coughs> Raspberry Pi is sucking a lot of current. Where does the current come from? It comes from the power supply, not from the input. And you see with this circuit right here, op amp man is going to look at that. If this voltage is higher than this voltage, it's going to drop this voltage. And it's going to keep dropping it until the two are the same. And since that's connected, right, the voltage here is going to be the same as the voltage there. And that's what we call a follower because it, the voltage here follows what the voltage there does. But the op amp provides the current. Alright, here's another quick circuit. We're a little short on time. Maybe I'll leave this one as an exercise to the reader. Here's a way you can make an amplifier. So imagine you have some small signal off of a photodiode or a microphone and you want to make it a big, I gave two bad examples because those are current signals. Let's say you convert them to a voltage with a resistor and then you want to amplify them up because they're too small for you to detect or get into what you, you need to, to do something with it. This is a way to amplify it. I'm going to leave this as an exercise to the reader since we're running short on time. Um, I have two resistors, right? This looks like, anyway, I've got this feedback going back here. Here's how you figure this one out. The first thing you do is you say if op amp man is doing his job, that voltage will be the same as that voltage. So that's zero volts, right? So if I know this voltage and I know that's zero volts, I can tell you how much current's flowing through there. If I know how much current's flowing through there, none of it goes in here, so that tells me how much current is flowing through here, right? So the output, so the voltage drop across there, I can determine from that current. So I get the current from this one, and I get the voltage by applying that current to this one. All right, so I'll just skip through that, but it turns out that you get, this is an inverting amplifier, you get a gain which is negative, so you can make your signal bigger, but it's flipped over. All right. Okay, digital circuits we mentioned. With digital circuits, ones and zeros are represented with different voltages. A common one that is used often is TTL, and that stands for transistor-transistor logic. In a TTL signal, zeros are zero volts and ones are five volts. All right. Um, Different logic gates. You guys have probably seen this. This is an AND gate. If I put 5 volts on both of these, I get 5 volts out. If either or both of these is 0 volts, I get 0 volts out, and so on. So different logic gates, different schematic symbols you can use to talk about digital logic. When you go to work with a digital chip, some, at some point you're going to find that the chip has something called a clock input. And the idea with a clock input is, so maybe I have like an, a digital to analog converter. I'm going to take a digital signal, I'm going to turn it to sound so I can play it on my speakers, right? But maybe it's a 16-bit input and I don't want to have 16 lines. I just want to use one line and send the bits in serially. So I have one line and I make it go high and low to send these bits. When does the chip, how does the chip know when to read the bits, right? If I have 5 volts to send a 1 and then 0 volts to send a 0, but what if it tries to read them faster and it instead thinks I want 10 ones followed by 10 zeros, right? I have to tell the chip when to read it and that's what the clock does. So I'll assert the voltage I want onto some data line input and then I'll make the clock go high It'll grab that, I'll bring it low again, I'll change the voltage on the input for my next bit, I'll make the clock go high, the chip will grab it, and so forth. Does that make sense? And a lot of chips will have a pin called an enable pin. And the idea with that is you can tell that chip to not look at the data line. Just ignore the clock and the data by setting the enable pin to the right voltage. So that way you can have like one data bus and a whole bunch of chips on it. And then you can turn one chip on. You can enable one and say, okay, now you listen to the data. Now hold that value, okay? Now we're going to turn that enable off and enable this one and give you your data and you change your value to that. And this one's still holding its old value. It didn't change because we told it not to listen to that digital word. All right. And then um, when you go to bar buy stuff, you can buy chips and different packages. These are leaded resistors. Leaded means it has leads that you can hold and you can solder and they're easy to work with. If you accidentally buy surface mount parts, they'll look more like this. So here's a surface mount resistor right there. And that's actually one of the bigger surface mount resistors they make. We do lots of surface mount stuff in my lab and it's awesome and hobbyists can do it. And if you're interested in how to do surface mount stuff in your garage without pulling your hair out, uh, a, a student of mine and I wrote a paper on how to do this. I, you can give me your email address and I'll send it to you or show you where it is. 
<coughs> once you learn how to do it, it's awesome. And I can actually build circuits faster this way than with Alita components. But there's some tricks to do it. So you don't want to buy surface mount stuff when you start out. You want to get leaded components that are easier to work with, that you can stick through a hole and solder in. Um, likewise, if you buy an op amp, these are some op amps. Um, if you, you know, buy an integrated circuit, you can get these little surface mount chips. They have lots of leads, and they're really tiny, and they're hard to solder. Um, I recommend when you start out, get something, look for things called DIP packages. It stands for dual inline package, and they look like this. They've got two rows of, of leads coming out on each side. Now, when you go to solder those into your circuit board, eventually something's going to break, or you're going to make a mistake, and you're going to need to get one of them out. And there's always a little bit of solder left behind. You know, you pull the solder off, there's always a little contact holding it in there. If you're dealing with a resistor, you can kind of heat up one side and pull it out, heat up the other side and kind of work it out. You can do that. But if you've got, you know, eight pins, or maybe you've got a pick chip with 40 pins, that's going to be a real pain to do. So instead, what you can do is you can solder down a chip socket, a dip socket. You solder that down and then you just stick your chip into it. Now they're a lot, a lot more reliable than the solderless breadboards because they're designed to only connect to one type of thing. They only have to do one job so they do it pretty well. So if you have a lot of ICs you're putting into your circuit, put them on top of these chip sockets and then uh, when something burns out just pull it out and replace it. All right, and we're almost done here. We're, we're out of time. Almost every component you buy will have a data sheet somewhere online. Know what's in it. If your circuit doesn't work, you probably um, didn't read the data sheet. Well, maybe. That could be one reason. Now, you can see here there's some pretty lousy solder joints here. Um, I don't really have, we're out of time, so you're going to have to learn how to solder somewhere else. But if you see rough, bumpy stuff that's not shiny, you probably better solder that again. Yes? We usually go to close to nine. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, in that case, <laughs> let me tell you a little bit about soldering. Soldering is really an art, and I took an electronics class in high school, and really the only thing we did for an entire semester is soldering. And so it's, it's a really useful tool. It was kind of boring for a high school kid, but I'm glad that I really know how to solder well. Um, thing about soldering, so you get your soldering iron, right? First thing about soldering irons, they get really hot, and metal, when it gets hot, it oxidizes. So you want to make sure there's always a little bit of solder on the tip of your soldering iron. And tips wear out, a lot of soldering irons, if it's a cheap soldering iron, maybe you just buy another soldering iron. If you have a more expensive soldering iron, you can buy new tips and replace the tips. So you want to keep some solder on them. If, if it's just, you try and you heat the thing up and the solder just doesn't melt, you maybe have an oxide layer on your tip and you can sand it just a little bit. And then immediately get some solder on there after you sand it so it doesn't oxidize. Um, when you go to solder things, all right, the temptation, they bring a new student into the lab, the first thing they want to do is they want to take the soldering iron and the solder, push them together, and glob solder over something. The problem with that is the solder doesn't actually, you want the solder not to just surround the metal, you want it to chemically bond to it. They call it wetting. You want the solder to wet to the surface. All right? In order for the solder to wet to the surface, the, solder, the surface has to be hot enough for the solder to be liquid on it. It can't touch it and then instantly you know, solidify. And it may look all globby and liquid on the outside, but in close to the material, it might be solid. So what you want to do is not touch the solder to the soldering iron. Well, I'll touch it a little bit. I'll put just a little dab of solder on the soldering iron because if I bring a soldering iron up close to something, it only makes contact at a point and the heat doesn't flow very well. So I'll put a little glob of solder on the soldering iron so that it makes good contact. But then, that's all, I'll, that's all the solder I'll put on the soldering iron. Then I'll heat the the lead or whatever it is I'm trying to solder up and I'll touch the solder to that and hold it there till the lead itself can make the solder melt. And then you get a good solder joint, all right? And make sure that both pieces are able to melt the solder by themselves. Then, once you've got the solder on them, pull the solder iron away and don't move it. Let it cool down for a few seconds. If it moves while it's cooling down, the crystal structure will break and you'll get stuff that looks like this garbage here where it's rough and dull. A good solder joint is smooth and shiny. If it's not smooth and shiny, you're probably going to have troubles down the road. All right, any other good things to tell about soldering? Make sure you do it well because it will cause you grief. Oh, I mentioned in my lab I have this $500 soldering iron. It goes really hot. It's got adjustable temperatures. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of chips can't, you know, you can't get the leads above a certain temperature or you have problems and so you can set the temperature. You know what I found? What I do, I'm probably somebody who knows better is going to tell me I'm totally stupid for doing this, but it's always worked. My approach is always get your soldering iron as hot as you can and then solder as fast as you can. That way it takes time for heat to, you know, 
flow up into the places where it's sensitive. If you have a long lead, you get in there, solder it quick. You know, I've never, I've never killed anything with heat that way before, you know? So um, people who do it industrially usually don't do it with side iron irons. They have big machines that heat like the whole board up and you have to worry about controlling the temperature better. But I just like my solder and irons nice and hot, do it fast before anything gets ruined. Um, a lot of times when you're soldering, you don't have enough hands. I've got a resistor, and I've got a wire, and I've got a soldering iron, and I've got solder. That's four things I've got to keep in position. Well, there's some tricks you can do. There are little things called helping hands, little alligator clips on a stick which you can hold things with. What I like to do is if I have a bunch, like imagine I'm trying to solder two wires together. What I'll do is I'll curl one of the wires up, set a book on it so it sits up on the table. I'll take it, I'll put the soldering iron on it, and I'll just put a little dab of solder on that wire. That solder has now wetted to the wire. I don't have to worry about cold solder joints now because the solder has already made its chemical bond to that. Do the same thing with the other wire. Then I can put the solder down, grab one of the wires, hold them together, touch the soldering iron to it just long enough for it to melt, and I've got a good solder connection. So there are tricks you can do. Um, we talked about desoldering. Don't leave your soldering iron on. Your tips will die, and maybe you'll start a fire. Um, and always keep solder on the tip to keep it from oxidizing. Oh, also when you buy your solder, almost any solder you buy is what they call rosin core solder. It's, it's the solder, you know, it's, it's a tin lead mixture that melts at a fairly low temperature and down the middle of it it's got this goo which when you heat it up it goes onto the surface and cleans gunk off and takes oxides off so that you can get a good solder joint. You can buy solder without rosin in it if you're not careful though and then it's really hard to make uh, connections. Um, remember when I showed you the wire earlier that I'd stripped some off of? What color was the wire? Does anyone remember? Red. The wire was red. What color was the metal? Silver. It was silver. What do you usually make wires out of? Copper. Copper. But the hookup wires will come pre-tinned with solder on them to make it because it's, it's kind of hard to make a good solder connection to bare copper. Uh, if you, if you want to do that, you have to make sure you get a lot of flux on it so that you make a good connection. But the hookup wires will come pre-tinned so that it's easy to make a solder connection to them. Um, debugging your circuit. That's where the fun begins. You all know about debugging, right? You go to write code. The code is simple. It's straightforward. You sit down and you write it, and then it doesn't work. <coughs> Does anyone ever like sit down and write a thousand lines of code and then compile? No, that's just stupid, right? It's crazy. You write a function. You make sure the function works, right? And then, and then you, you build it a little bit as you go. The same thing applies with electronics. Don't take some big electronic project and put it all together. When I was a kid, Radio Shack had these cool electronic kits with little spring things where you could put wires in. I had no idea what I'd do, but I'd just go through and put the wires where they said, and it was all done. I'd push the button, and hopefully it worked. When you're building electronics, you don't want to do that. You're going to build a little part. You're going to make sure your voltage divider gives you the voltage you want, and then you're going to build the follower after it and make sure that works, and test each piece as you go, all right? Because it's really hard to debug a complex circuit. Um, just, has anyone ever looked at like an electrical schematic? I don't know, you had a piece of equipment that had some schematic, and you looked at it and you said, how could anyone possibly understand that? Well, the trick is, you can draw little boxes around things. It's little components that do something, and then it goes into something with a high input impedance, so you don't have to worry about, you just have to think about one part at a time. And that's how you should debug, too. Each little piece of the circuit is a function. Someone needs to come up with a programming language for electrical engineers that does not delineate functions, where you don't actually know when one function starts and another one ends. Because that's how schematics look, right? Schematics really should have boxes around them so that you know how all the parts go together. But anyway, debug your circuit as you go. If something's not working, the first thing I do, the first thing I tell my students to do is check that each chip is getting the voltage it's supposed to get. Because oftentimes that's the problem. A power supply will have like, somebody drew, drew too much current out of it and it went into like a low current standby mode or something. Make sure that, make sure your chips are getting the voltage they're supposed to. <coughs> now, how do I know if a component has failed? Is this op amp dead or not? If smoke leaves. Yeah, if smoke comes out of it, it's probably dead. <laughs> That's usually one sign. Um, but, no, though you mention that, sometimes people, my students will think this, this component doesn't work because it's really hot. But silicon has a really high melting temperature. Some electronics are designed to run pretty hot. If you've ever known, owned an HP laptop, you know about that, <laughs> right? Um, yes. But some electronics are designed to run hot, so don't freak out if it's hot. Um, 
But if it's glowing, it's probably bad. But um, how do I know if a component's working? So if a student shows me, they'll say, I think this op amp might be broken. The first thing we do, measure the two inputs. What's an op amp's job? Op amp man's job is to adjust the output to keep the two inputs at the same voltage. If those two inputs are at the same voltage, op amp man is doing his job, leave him alone. Let him do his job, okay? Somebody else is the problem. If those two inputs are not the same, but the output is railed, like if the plus input is higher than the negative input, but the output is railed at the positive power supply voltage, op amp man is doing his job. He's put out the highest voltage he can to try and get it there. So that op amp's probably not dead. Okay? If it's not doing its job, it still might not be dead. It might be that something is shorted out downstream and it can't provide enough current. But if it's doing its job, you know that's not the problem. Yeah? Do you have to remove it from the circuit to uh, do that test like you were suggesting with the resistors? <coughs> that's, I think, my next item. Um, no, you don't. You don't. Like, if you can see that the op amp is doing its job in the circuit, if those two input pins are the same voltage, or if the output's railed the way it should, then you say, that's not the problem. I'm going to look for something else. Why is the output railed? Like, for example, you know, something must be shorted somewhere. Anyway, but if, if, if it's not doing its job, maybe there's a reason it's not doing its job. Maybe it's not broken. Maybe there's something downstream that's drawing too much current so it can't get the voltage where it needs to go. So then you can take it out of your circuit, build a simpler circuit around it to see if it works. Okay. Well, I mean, probably the easy thing is just pull it out and put a new one in. If it still doesn't work, they're probably both good. But then you wonder, maybe they're both bad. So then maybe you build a little test circuit to make sure they really work, right? But if it fixes the problem, then you know it was bad. And you, and you throw the bad one away. I don't know why. <laughs> My students, they're like, wow, this was like a $2 chip. And I don't want to waste a $2 chip. It's broken, so they put it back in with the other chips. I didn't, want to, I didn't know I was supposed to throw it away. Anyway, throw away stuff that's broken. So um, do you find that the tests that you can do in circuit are typically the ones that you're only measuring voltage to check? Typically, the yeah. Because it's hard to interrupt the circuit, but, although you can. But like I say, it's just most things you can figure out with voltage. So I hardly ever use a current meter. There are times when I do, but mostly the voltmeter is, is your tool of choice. Um, another thing you can do is isolate problems. Remember how our circuit is made up of these little pieces? See if each piece is working. Start with the first piece that a signal comes in, into. Disconnect a wire or a resistor or something so that it's not feeding into the next part of the circuit and see if it's doing its job. Then put that wire back, disconnect the wire on the output of the next section, see if it's doing its job and just follow your signal down the chain and kind of isolate it because you've got, you got this big hairy circuit, you want to check it one piece at a time. And you know, we debugged it as we went, right? But then maybe something broke and so then we have to go back and find out which one it is. If something doesn't work, this is another thing that students like to do. They'll build a part, they'll debug it, and it doesn't quite work, but you know, I need to graduate in a month and so let's build the next part. Do not build the next part until the first part works. Or you're going to spend the rest of your life with a circuit that doesn't do anything. Okay, remember, you can't measure resistance capacitance um, with a meter correctly in circuit. You can if you're, if you're clever, though. If you like have a resistor and you know you measure the voltage drop across it and you know what that resistor is, then you go to the next one and you say, ah, I know how much current's flowing through that one because I figured it out from this one and I can measure what the resistance is. Um, Especially, you cannot measure resistances, capacitances, and things if your circuit is powered up. Because that just, I mean, current's going to be flowing from everywhere. It's going to get into your multimeter. Your multimeter won't have any idea what's going on. And it'll give you a reading that makes absolute nonsense. Um, anyway, that is everything I had prepared to talk to you about. Are there any questions? <laughs> That's a little web comic I do. If you want to go so check out sqcomic.com. I'm going to yeah. say like uh -huh. a practical application. You have uh -huh. a circuit board that you're using to water your lawn. Mm -hmm. So you plug it in and you're getting 110 volts mm -hmm. right, with the necessary amps, whatever mm -hmm. it is. But the circuit boards typically can't handle near that much electricity. Right. So you have a huge resistor there. 
right? Usually, okay, so if you're doing something that has higher voltages or higher currents, typically those things will be controlled by a low voltage, low current circuit. And then there will be like a big MOSFET or something on the output that takes a low voltage, low current control signal and controls something more powerful. Like if you wanted to turn the solenoid valves on on your lawn, yeah. probably you'd have a little low voltage op amp and everything with your timer, you know, the output from your Raspberry Pi or whatever. And then kind of the last element will be like a, an AC MOSFET where you can turn on an electrical switch with a low current 5 volt signal. And you can just buy these things that it's like... And so mm -hmm. sort of the electricity then bypasses... The yeah. So it's kind of like I've got a big switch and I've got this little 5 volt signal that turns the switch on and off. But the current then comes from somewhere else. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've got the components up here if anyone wants to come and see some of the stuff. That, you know, see what it really looks like. Um, oh, in regards to my first Raspberry Pi project, I, I had this great design for an amplifier and a speaker, and then I started thinking like, you know, for 10 bucks I can buy amplified speakers. So another key to electronics is sometimes it's just fun to build stuff just because you want to, you know. But a lot of times you can find big pieces of what you're building commercially available for cheap, and then, you know, then you don't have to reinvent the wheel. But sometimes it's really fun building it. I wish my daughter could come. She's at karate. but. Um, I got these huge speakers. The acoustics people in our department were throwing out these speakers because they were broken. And so I managed to nab three of them. It's just a flaky electrical connection. Easy fix. <laughs> so now I have this totally kick butt speaker system in my lab, but I didn't have an amplifier. But we had these high current MOSFETs for a you know, different project. We had some left over. So my daughter came in to work in my lab over the summer. She's like, what can I do? build us an audio amplifier. So, you know, it's something I could have bought for not too much money, but it was a heck of a lot of fun for her to build this amplifier. And every time she comes to the lab and she brought her friends down once, like, listen to this amazing this audio system, I built that. So sometimes it's fun to build things you could just buy, but there are things you can buy. Other questions? It sounds like most of you have done some of this before, so I, I thank you for staying awake and smiling through most of the presentation regardless, but yeah.